Hello everyone, Chuckles here, and I'm about to get started on the reading challenges for this year's Asian Readathon, the 2022 Asian Readathon. Of course, by the time you see this, I would have, I will have already done it, but I wanted to, as I said in the last video, come on here and talk about the previous book that I read, not for the challenges, because I'm sticking to the one ethnicity per book that counts for the challenges, so instead of having a, a Frangipani Hotel, count for the challenges. I'm instead going to have Violet Cooper Smith's novel, Build Your House Around My Body, count for that. But I wanted to give a little review of this anyway. Not a really uh, extensive review, but just like general thoughts. Um, and I'm going to be, just so we're clear, I'm going to be very vague because uh, this is nine short stories and therefore I want to like not give anything away because you should all read this book. It's very good. And I want to give away as little as possible, so I'm going to be very vague in my language, so therefore it's not going to be real, a, a real extensive review, and it's not, the point of this isn't to review it necessarily anyway, I just wanted to give my general thoughts before I talk about going into uh, the next thing. So, like I said, overall, I thoroughly enjoyed the Frangipani Hotel. It should have been called uh, the Frangipani Hotel and other stories, because <laughs> I thought that, I knew it was an anthology, but I thought they the anthology took place at the hotel in question. But no, the Frangipani Hotel is one isolated story out of nine stories. I was like, oh well, since it's a hotel, that means there's like a hotel implies all kinds of different uh, stories, different people and different rooms and different mysteries that you can survive. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of exciting things happening at the hotel, but no, no, that was just one story. So I will, I will simply give my assessment of uh, overall and uh, the nine stories specifically. Overall, I'm looking forward now very much to uh, the novel because she's a good writer, <laughs> Miss Cooper Smith. Now I will start my little review of the stories in from the bottom and go up to the top. In other words, ascending order, my least to most favorite. I'm doing this because I want to be positive for the most part and there's only one story that I dislike. All the other ones, even though I rank them low, are it's like it's just literally least favorite to most favorite. But the bottom one is one I actually do not like, the story called Guests. I do not like this story. I hate the main character. I find her despicable, <laughs> especially something that she does at the very end. Again, not giving anything away, but there's something that she does at the very end that is tied into something that she has been doing for the for the rest of the story that made me not like her, among other reasons that I don't like her. And then this thing at the end, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, um, you can die. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, we get to know this character sort of, but not really, because I'm like, I'm, why are you, why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? And why do you feel this way? I don't really get it. Actually, one of the characters in the book basically asks her, why are you like this? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, fair question, why? I feel like I get all the other stories and I sort of get what Cooper Smith was going for with this one with guests, but I, I'm just like, but nothing happened. Nothing occurred. <laughs> I mean, things occurred, but it was like basically relationship drama and then the hint of something supernatural that actually didn't go anywhere and then something else tied into that despicable thing that she does that I guess is supposed to, you're supposed to think of it as supernatural, but it's basically like a coincidence given what this book is. I think you're supposed to, by the end of it, be like, ah, oh, you see that? Oh, that mean, that implies that maybe there, but I'm like, okay, but that wasn't really established firmly in the story. <laughs> So yeah, it's a story about relationship drama and being a fish out of water. Um, I understand the anxieties of the main character being a fish out of water in the way that she is, and the anxieties about relationships, the anxieties about children. Like, I, I understand, but I'm just like, what's the point? Maybe unlike the other eight stories, I'm just missing something here, but I'm like, man, this is... It's the second longest story, and... 
it didn't it wasn't boring for me because the entire time I was going okay all right something's gonna happen something's gonna happen eventually something will happen nothing happened <laughs> maybe it was just my mindset that like this is a, a ghost story anthology and so because this was the one story where it like really wasn't that I was just waiting for something that never came again supernatural things are sort of kind of implied but not really and it's weird and again hate the main character don't like any of the characters actually there's one interesting character who's a side character um and i was like oh, okay what this guy is interesting and the rest of them i'm like i just ugh, just get away from me all of you so unfortunately that's the, that's the one story that i absolutely dislike all the rest of them now again i like them all it's just in ascending order of least favorite to most favorite so uh the next up on that list would be descending dragon i am going to say pretty much nothing about this one because it is the shortest story seven pages descending dragon is seven pages boat story is eight pages so the the book is book ended with two with the two shortest stories it starts with the second shortest story boat story and it ends with the absolute shortest story, which is Descending Dragon. I turn the page, I was like, oh, oh, it's over. Okay. <laughs> but it's good for what it is. I was saying the supernatural elements in guests don't really come into play. Uh, Descending Dragon isn't really supernatural at all. You'll see what I mean, but it's, 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 it is disturbing and very sad, let's put it that way, and then move on, because again, don't want to say anything else. One Finger is, uh, or I guess you pronounce it One Finger. One Finger is one of the spookier stories, and it is really good. The story is told in a very interesting way. It's kind of about how stories are told, as well as being about this particular story. And there's an interesting juxtaposition between uh, supernatural and something that is not supernatural, but abnormal. <laughs> And as I said before I started reading the book, I was like, it seems like this book covers all the challenges, and yes it does, because in fact pretty much this one short story covers every single one of the challenges. Asian, Asian featuring Asian characters and older, universe you'd like to explore, highly rated, and cover worthy of googly eyes, except I wish this wasn't there. I do, I understand, you want the to have the um, praise blurbs on the book as as a promotion but without the 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 digital cover that represents the book when I listed it on Storygraph doesn't have this and this beautiful somber lake fog lake with the boat looks really nice and it still looks nice I just you know I understand why this is there it's just eh. so that's one finger and again moving on not being very not saying a whole lot about it the red veil Oh, I skipped over Boat Story. Boat Story go goes before this one. Boat Story, like I said, is the second shortest story. It's quaint. It's wholesome. <laughs> Even though it's a belongs in the ghost story anthology that this is, it's still a it's it's a it's kind of funny and kind of pleasant, kind of wholesome story while also having dark roots, as most all these stories do, because it's like all this stuff is informed by the Vietnam War. Most of the characters in here have been affected by the war, whether they are older people who participated in it or the sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters of people who participated in the war or are affected by it in some way. And that of course seeps into the mythology as well. The Red Veil is the closest that Cooper Smith comes to depicting cosmic horror in uh, this anthology. It's not quite there, but it's pretty close and it's very unsettling and very mysterious and I really like it rather than being an entity which some of these stories have an entity in fact most of them have an entity a supernatural entity to deal with this is more like something is happening and there are maybe multiple entities or maybe there is no entity or may, or there's something going on that you're not quite sure of and it has and then in in cosmic horror fashion it deals with like madness and uh transferring that to other people other people knowing what they shouldn't know things like that really good it is i think the most descriptive in terms of 
world building. Whereas pretty much all the other stories are like, here's Vietnam or here's America with Vietnamese people in it. <laughs> and it's like you understand more or less the geography and they don't spend a whole lot of time on it. But the Red Veil paints a picture of this really interesting and beautiful sounding picturesque location with extremely poor people back in ye olden times and the description of the forests and bamboo and bamboo groves and uh, temples and all kinds of interesting locations that we see throughout the story is really well told and really the world building really gets in there and makes you imagine all the wonderful yet dreadful places that this goes. Little Brother, this was the one story that I felt the way that I do about uh, a lot of uh, horror films. You'll hear me talk about this in a, a video coming up on the Afro Pictures channel, but when people talk about how, you know, if people behaved logically, if people thought and like <laughs> acted like a normal human being in horror movies, well then you wouldn't have a movie. And my response to that is, uh, the best horror movies have people who do, whether it's a thriller or a horror or what have you, the best movies that have mystery or have a serious threat have characters that behave logically, the way a human being you would think would act or is supposed to act. Even if you say, well, you don't know how you would behave, yeah, that's true, but I am watching this film and I'm trying to get invested in this character, and when this character does something that is clearly stupid <laughs> and is going to get them killed, I'm like, well, now I don't really care. Now I'm not really going to be scared, and now I'm not really going to fear for their lives a whole lot because they're this is the Darwin Awards, and they're about to win the grand prize of death. And that's what happened here at the beginning, because again, not giving it away, but the main character, <laughs> it's, it's very clearly set up. It's very clearly set up. It's like, okay, hey, you, you, this right here, don't do this. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. And the, the guy's like, I'm going to do it. And I will say, uh, it's very clearly established who this guy is and why he does the thing, even though he is told not to do the thing. It makes sense that he would do it. It's still like, all right, well, there you go. Let's just sit back and watch you die now. <laughs> but I have to say, even though, even so, the way that the story gets into his head and really gets into his psyche and like why he does what he does, why he chose to do the thing that he's doing right now, and like it, it, I was still invested even though I felt initially like oh man this guy's stupid that's how i was able to remain invested and not feel like oh, okay well whatever you're just gonna die i mean i kind of did feel like that but it was still very interesting and it was still really creepy <laughs> skin and bones i think is the scariest story by far this if you're if you're used to reading hor horror books or watching horror movies you're not really going to find this scary but it is still going to be intriguing and mysterious, and it's still going. To, you, you can still consider it creepy. Uh, Skin and Bones is definitely the creepiest story. Uh, part of that has to do with the fact that the main character is a child, which is also why the main character of Skin and Bones, like the main character of Little Brother, makes a dumb decision. But she's a child, and she is in an unfamiliar setting and trying to just grasp onto some kind of comfort. And again, Cooper Smith delves into the character and really gets into their psyche. We understand uh, this girl's motivations and her anxieties and why she is the way she is and why she is currently doing the thing that she is doing. And when the thing that she is doing leads to the thing that happens, <sighs> excellent, like I said, the creepiest, I think. Turning Back is my second favorite story and contains my favorite main character. In stark contrast to Guests, where I'm, I just don't, I don't like the main character and I'm like, why, why are you, why are you? <sighs> why you do this? I feel like I know <laughs> the main character of Turning Back and I love her. And I, that was good because man, <laughs> again, she, she gets herself into a situation 
where under normal circumstances you'd be like, no, 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 Why, what are you doing? Stay away. But once again, we are allowed into the psyche of this character and understand exactly what she's about and see her life and see what, what everything she's doing and be like, you know what? Yeah, I understand completely why she would do this <laughs> despite the potential danger. And I was like right there in anticipation and then feeling a bit of <laughs> dread when things occur. <laughs> Let's just say this is one of those stories where a character who feels stuck in life and just apathetic about everything has themselves an experience. And finally, my favorite story is the title story. I, the title story, I think, is the best one, the Frangipani Hotel. It is the longest story as well. Again, world building. I feel like I am in the hotel with Cooper Smith's descriptions of it. I actually had to look up what a frangipani was. I would have known just by reading the story, but I was like, what the heck is a I, I know I've heard that word before. Oh, right. Plumeria. <laughs> I think frangipani is a more fun word, but <laughs> even though it's a short story, the world building and really getting to know the few characters that we spend time with really lets me feel like I've been in this hotel and uh, observing all these characters. It was easy for me to get into the main character's headspace, especially when the supernatural element is introduced. I basically felt the same way he does. When the when that supernatural element comes in, he basically goes, okay, that is clearly <laughs> something not of this world. Am I in danger? I don't know. Uh, I guess, I guess I'm just doing this now. I guess this is my life now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll just go along with it for now because I don't know what else I can do. And the entire time as you're getting to know the city and the hotel and the characters who run it and the characters who are introduced, you're, you're, in the back of your mind is like this element is like, okay, how is that? Okay, now this is happening. Okay, now this is happening, but still nothing too crazy, but I, want, I don't know. You're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And finally, uh, near the end, not quite near, at the very end, but near the end, you, the reader, definitely understand what's about to happen before the main character do it, does, and you're like, oh, okay, that's where it's going. All right, now just wait and see how exactly it's going to go down. And I just, I just loved it. I loved the whole process of figuring out what was what and how things connect to what, learning about the lower class perspective of workers in uh, Vietnam, hotel workers and the hotel manager imply that it's a used to be a nice hotel but not anymore and they're kind of on the lower end but they do get to rub shoulders with the higher end high net worth individuals who come to Vietnam, foreigners who come to Vietnam just to use it as a playground basically. Really interesting and really insightful into again different attitudes in regards to Vietnam uh, in the modern day, how things have been affected by the past, their love-hate relationship with foreigners, and really their love-hate relationship with their own country. <laughs> I, it's really excellent. Really loved it. So, that is the Frangipani Hotel. That's my little review. Again, it's not really in-depth because I want, I want you all to read it, and I don't want to give anything away. So now, it is finally time for me to get going on Build Your House Around My Body, which I will actually be using. I'm finally gonna get to put things in the story graph page, because as I explained, you go onto the story graph page and you put in like, here's how, here, here are the pages I've read and here's the books that counts for this, here's the challenges, blah, blah, blah. I haven't put anything in there yet, like 0% complete. Finally gonna get a lot done on there, I believe, with this book and then it will be on to uh, Iron Widow. So before I read it, I'm just, again, from the last video, saying that I'm glad that I forgot, because it's been long enough that I've forgotten what they said in that interview, or again, I don't even remember if they talked to her or if they just talked about her, but whatever they said got me intrigued about Build Your House Around My Body, but I don't even remember what? I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a horror book, or if it's a thriller, or if it's a mystery, or all of the above. 
I'm pretty sure it has something to do with folklore, even if it's not directly like supernatural things happening. That still, I believe, informs uh, the book. But that's basically all I know. So I'm excited. Let's get into it. Okay, I've spent the last two days consuming Build Your House Around My Body in audio form, reading it that way, and uh, all of the above was correct. <laughs> Answer D. All of the, it is a supernatural mystery suspense crime thriller, <laughs> and it weaves all of those things together. Well, yeah, yes, it weaves all of them together by the end, but it's not like it's all that all the time. It's like, I would describe this book as genre bending, and it bends as it goes. So it starts out like just a mystery. It's just a mystery novel, basically. And then the supernatural elements start to come in and it becomes more of like a, a horror anthology similar to the Frangipani Hotel. Then it sort of dips into a little bit of the crime thriller uh, flavor, and by the end it basically becomes a magic realism fantasy adventure. <laughs> And I loved every minute of it. This is basically what I was expecting that Cooper Smith would do in the Frangipani Hotel, uh, but didn't happen there because that's just an anthology. Whereas I, what I suspected that she would do there is what she did with this book, which I guess is like <laughs> Frangipani Hotel was like her practice because this is, in fact, vignettes all over the place that, as it turns out, are all interconnected, <laughs> that you don't realize that yet. Well, given what this book is, you do realize it's like, okay, I'm guessing these things are connected. They don't seem like it right now, but I'm guessing they will be, and they are, in fact, that way. I read a little review blurb underneath the book on Audible, and it basically said, I'm paraphrasing here, there's so much nonsense just being thrown at the reader that if it were a lesser author, it would be a complete mess. But Cooper Smith is so masterful that she is able to take all this craziness and juggle it deftly. And just like with Frangipani, I'm going to be vague. I can be a little less vague here because it's a big old novel, but I'm still not going to give anything away because you definitely need to read this, okay? A Viet-American expat living in Saigon goes missing. That's it. That's the setup. <laughs> and then, basically the entire plot... So this is an ensemble. It's like all these different characters, all these different perspectives all these different points of view. It's an ensemble cast, but there is a, technically speaking, main character in Winnie, aka Wan Nguyen. Forgive me for mispronouncing Vietnamese, but Wan Nguyen, aka Winnie. She is sort of the main character, and she's gone missing in the, at the very beginning of the book. The entire story revolves around this one point in time, her going missing. Every single chapter is titled Location, comma, Amount of Time Related to the Disappearance. There are only two or three chapters that are either on the day of the disappearance or immediately following the disappearance. All the other chapters are taking place a certain amount of time before the disappearance. And we're either with Winnie before whatever happened to her happened to her, or we're with someone completely different who we come to find out is connected in some way as we're trying to unravel the mystery of what exactly happened. So we will start with, it's like Winnie. I think I think this this uh, this story takes place maybe five ten years ago, but basically you know modern times in Saigon like three months before, so let's see what she was doing at that time, and maybe get some clues that you won't realize yet are having to do with what happened to her, but like, oh, here's some little, what she's dealing with right now. Okay, and then, uh, okay, now here's a few weeks before her disappearance, and here's a completely different person. Like, what? who is that? <laughs> and okay, and now uh, let's go uh, 10 years <laughs> before she was even in Saigon. When she was still in America, and we're with this, these characters now, okay, all right. Maybe how this is related, I don't know, but okay, we're with them, all right. That's, that's cool, I guess. 65 years in the past. Completely different location. Once you realize, and if you already know, that this is a mystery 
novel, then you will realize, okay, we're going, it's going to be connected somehow. And indeed, I have read stories like this before, where it's like, okay, here's, a th here's an event, and now let's figure out why this event is taking place, and in order to give this event context, let's look in the distant past with things that you might not think are related, but now when we see, oh, so this was actually what affected this way later. So I, I've, I've read and I've seen things like that before, so I knew what to expect, but it was still thoroughly enjoyable how it happened in this book. If those of you who are uh, mystery lovers have already figured out what the deal is here, yes, this does the thing that good mystery novels should do, which is provide you, drip-feed you, <laughs> clues the entire time so that the reader can figure things out on their own. Maybe maybe before the characters do, or maybe they'll figure it out with the characters, but even if they figure it out with the characters, once it's revealed, then they will go, oh, so that's why then, and then, and then, aha, because I remember. And the way that you do that is by really careful, precise, um, and evocative descriptions, world building, characterization, and descriptions of characters that make it stick in your mind. I especially love the way that Cooper Smith details uh, objects, objects related to characters, characters' mannerisms, the way that characters look, and reinforces them over and over, not in an annoying way, but like, you know, like maybe a character will mention something about a certain a person's appearance, or several times a, a person's uh, hat or shoe or something will take significance and like, oh, look at this, okay, and now as we're going along, I'm just reminding you, this is here, okay, and then we're going along, and um, oh, by the way, this thing over here, still, still this, keeping it in your mind, so that then when we go into wherever in the timeline with completely different characters, and suddenly you see that object, you're like, oh, that object. Or you see someone whose who's name name isn't mentioned, but a certain character trait comes up, and you're like, wait, that so that person was there, and they were the oh? And again, this story is nutty. <laughs> it's, it is all over the place on top of that. So props to Cooper Smith for being able to pull the reader along. I know nothing about Vietnam other than the fact that it exists and it is the place where that god-awful war happened. And I know, even though I don't understand it, I know more or less what the language sounds like. And I do have friends who are Viet American, but I basically know nothing. And I definitely don't know anything about the folklore. And it, all of that is just heavy in here. The culture, the folklore, obviously, that's it's just all here on the full display in this crazy story. So to have someone who's a complete novice when it comes to Vietnam and its culture and its folklore to pull me along and have me understanding everything that's happening and understanding who the characters are and understanding when someone says a certain thing, I'm like, ah, I recognize that word even though I don't really understand, I recognize it and I recognize these these characters, I recognize these objects, I recognize this description, I recognize this location. You are able to grasp all that regardless of how well you understand. And I'm listening to it too, so I can't actually see what these words are when, when um, uh, let me let me get the narrator here. Kuyen Ngo. Don't know if that's how you pronounce that, but Kuyen Ngo. Uh, Vietnamese American, at least she sounds like it. Could be Canadian, of course. Uh, excellent narration and she pronounces everything, I assume, correctly, so I'm, I'm just having to listen to it and I can't actually read the words to see what it says, but I'm still able to comprehend. It did trip me up at the very end, I will say. I ended the book being, unfortunately, uh, confused and frustrated for a bit. <laughs> because, not again, not giving anything away, but uh, the very last part of the book, and again, the last section, the last like fourth of the book, it just goes off the wall, crazy. Like, hopefully you have been primed enough that now you will accept all of this. And then the epilogue, there are some characters and descriptions and like going off of what is said and what is going on, what is happening, different objects. I'm like, aha, okay, these characters, I know who these characters are. And then one character says to another what I heard as Ian, 
since it's audible, you can't read it, so I, for the purpose of this video, I went back and listened to it several times and then tried to search on Google what I thought it was, and it never was what I thought it was, and finally I went, oh, duh. Vietnamese terms of affection. I'm pretty sure it's this word, which I is pronounced something like I. And I went, Ian? Who the hell is that? What? There's no Ian? There's been no Ian this entire time. What are you doing? Who is this? And so I was frustrated. I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> Bringing a brand new character. And I was like, wait a second. Let me, let me try and uh, <laughs> think about this. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I misheard. And also, I remember that there was another section early on in the book, in fact, pretty early on, dealing with these characters as well. And I was like, maybe I was kind of drifting off. The one time I was kind of drifting off was in that little section, that little, in, in this chapter. So let me go back and, and read that part, listen to that part. And I did, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, I, I did miss a couple of things there. Okay, so I got it. So yeah, that's definitely these characters, but so let, you know what, let me go back and hear that again. And then I, I listened carefully, and I was like, okay, Pretty sure that was a Vietnamese word that I just heard as the Western name Ian, but it's really just like an expression. Okay, <laughs> that makes sense. So if you recall, I said that I just despised the main character of the short story Guests, my least favorite story in Frangipani Hotel. Well, the main character of Build Your House Around My the main character of Build Your House Around My Body. <laughs> is basically a, an improved version of that character. Winnie is, I mean, she's a loser. <laughs> she is a loser, but it's not the kind of loser that you just scoff at or like hate. She's just got nothing going for her in her life. She feels stuck. She's uh, at the kind of quarter life crisis thing, which I'm, I'm privileged enough to have never really dealt with, but I understand it, at least on an intellectual level. Her siblings are just doing way better than she is, being more successful and everything like that. And her parents are, at least from her perspective, her parents are like, oh yeah, and then also this daughter right here, yeah. Although she denies it, she has basically come to Saigon for a fresh start and to sort of find herself in her roots. The, the Vietnamese, she, she is like Cooper Smith herself, half Viet, half Euro-American, and she, I, I, want to, I want to get in touch with my roots and perhaps become a better person than I already am, which is not a, basically nothing is what she thinks of herself. And so now she's in Vietnam where everyone can tell that she's a foreigner, even though she sort of looks like them. And there's a lot of uh, time paid, paid to her talking about how what she thinks of her body, what she thinks of like comparing herself to other women, especially a, a certain co-worker where she's like, oh yeah, she's like the better version of me. She looks better. She's like more more of the Vietnamese features that Vietnamese women are supposed to have. She behaves like a proper Vietnamese woman, blah, 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 blah. So she felt like nothing in America. And then she comes to Vietnam and also feels like nothing, but in a different way. <laughs> So she is just a, a miserable loser, and very early on, you start to get the sense that, okay, any number of things could have happened to this girl. She could have been kidnapped by these people over here, something supernatural could have happened, she could have just gotten up and walked off on her own accord. You don't know, and it stays mysterious right up until that last fourth, that last, that, that, insane <laughs> magic realism adventure. But before you get there, you're meeting all, uh, whilst getting more context and getting to know Winnie more and more of her adventures, you're also getting all these other adventures with all these other people. And again, it's all interconnected. And as you slowly start to piece it together, you start to think like, well, perhaps this happened, or maybe it was uh, this element influencing this over here that caused the disappearance to occur. But how does that disappearance relate to this that I'm learning about? Like, I'm learning how all of this is connected, but how is it connected to Winnie? And as I said, figuring all that out is really fun uh, when you learn all the connections. So we got self-esteem, generational trauma, racism, colorism, the Vietnam War, relationships between the French and the Vietnamese, social dynamics, sexual dynamics between men and women, and you know what? 
They even throw in some LGBT representation in there. A bit, not a whole lot, but it's definitely there. I was like, oh, was not expecting that. And then also, a lot of spoops. <laughs> a lot of spooky supernatural stuff going on. It is a drip feed, and initially, when it starts to come in, you're like, okay, is this real, or is it just like a suggestion, and it's like sort of metaphorical? But as it keeps going, you're like, okay, no, it's stuff is definitely happening. So that you accept this, and then you accept a little more, and then you accept a little more, and then the really ludicrous stuff starts happening. And you're like, oh, well, I, yeah, you know what? Because of all, because all this was established way over here, I now understand that this is happening and why it is happening. And then you get to the just utter nonsense. I say utter nonsense, but no, it, it may, like, stuff happens in the final act of the book that is just off the wall, even in comparison to everything that's happened before. But because of everything that's happened before, you're like, okay, I even then I wasn't expecting this, but because of all that, I'm like, okay, why not? <laughs> and at a certain point you go, is this tragic? Is it funny? Is it happy? Is it sad? Is it meant to be taken literally or just metaphorical? Yes. Yes to all. Again, all of the above. Like at a certain point when you're learning about all the stuff that happened in the past, you're just like down. Like it's excellent, but you're just like, man, boy, all this just sucks. These poor people. But then by the end, you kind of don't know what to feel. It's like, happy? Sad? <laughs> Huh? Confused? Yes? Just like with Frangipani, it's... I'm, I'm starting to pronounce it differently now. Frangipani. Frangipani. I don't know how to pronounce that word, I just realized. I should have looked it up before this. Oh well. And then I lost my train of thought and didn't recover it for the rest of the night. If I hadn't cut it right here, then you would have seen me go... Just like with Frangipani Hotel for like half an hour and then just give up and go to bed. So now I'm inserting this here after I've edited almost all of the video and I'm just gonna put this at the end, the last, the last bit here, while I give my final three points. First is what I was trying to get at, <laughs> which was just like with the French Pani Hotel, Vietnamese American perspective. So it's definitely, there's a lot of, uh, from the outside looking in, even though it's definitely more of an inside than, as I said, a person who knows nothing about Vietnam. But in this way, it is, I think, very understandable and relatable for people who may not be close to the source. And, as I said, the Vietnam War just hangs over everything. The war takes center stage in some of these, some characters' um, stories and arcs that, of course, inform what happens to Winnie. It's all wrapped up in the relationships that the Vietnamese people have with themselves, with foreigners, with the United States, with Europe. And a lot of what we see from the various characters, whether they are native Vietnamese or from other places, or native and then grew up or did business or was more uh, culturally influenced by other places is a general attitude of <laughs> negativity for a lot of the cultural trappings of Vietnam itself. There's a lot of attention paid to people, again, looking from the outside who think that the country is beautiful, but they don't really want to interact with it that closely. And they certainly think of it as dangerous and not clean. And that attitude is infectious and just worms its way into the hearts and minds of many people who live in the areas in which we see all the characters interact. And a lot of what we could see as the negative attributes of Vietnamese society and culture is a product of the knock-on effects from the war. And although the story doesn't ever deal with this topic directly, necessarily, it certainly informs everything that happens in it, and the characters' lives, and the ways in which we see different attitudes with different people, and the way in which crime is represented as just sort of being a fact of life. Which is uh, the one criticism I have that 
the crime story element wasn't as uh, significant as everything else was, and the characters involved, they didn't do much. I thought they were going to, and they did not. Unlike the rest of the, the, there are central characters who are, again, it's an ensemble cast. Even though Winnie is technically the main character, there are several more central characters in the ensemble. And then there are many other side characters who have significance to the plot. And the section of the story that focuses on the crime aspect, again, not I'm being vague here, but those characters are introduced and they function as a way of moving the plot forward for the more important characters. And while other side characters serve their purpose in a similar way, they have a more significant role to play in the proceedings than these individuals involved with the crime element do. The crime element is just sort of a fact of life background thing, like this happens in Saigon. As far as those characters who are directly involved with it, they're just kind of there and they don't do much. They're just like, they're there and then they're also there, informing the more important characters. Whereas the other side characters, they're not just there. They, when they affect the plot and when they affect the more important character stories, they really affect it. So I understand, uh, I think, that it's just sort of representing like, yeah, hey, horrible stuff happening in Saigon. And it's just there because like, yep, that's one of those things that, again, is part of that whole, there are negative aspects to the culture that people just look down on and even in their own country they hate it. And you kind of have to acknowledge that... <laughs> Things would probably be different and better if it weren't for that war that just hangs over everything, including right now in the modern day. But I wish that those characters that were introduced, especially the ones that are introduced early on, would have actually had a bigger presence and done more to affect the plot than just seem like they're going to be significant but then really not, and just be background characters in this element that this central character is tangentially related to so that we can have that just be a little a little stopping point on this character's journey. Fortunately, that crime drama stuff is only a small part of the proceedings, so I didn't have to be disappointed in it for very long. And that is about all I have to say about Build Your House Around My Body. Uh, one more thing, though, that I have to say. I'm done! It's over! <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, Asian Readathon 2022 challenges complete. Just like with the previous book, this one counts for every single one of the challenges. Book written by an Asian person. I love supporting a fellow Hapa, by the way. Featuring an Asian woman and or an older person. Both, and lots of them. The central, again, Winnie could be considered the main character. There are other central female characters and other central old people characters. Universe that you would like to explore, again, know nothing about Vietnam, learned a lot from these two books. Cover worthy of googly eyes, both variant covers fit this to a T. I think this one is the better cover, just purely from an artistic standpoint, but I like this one better. Highly rated, it is indeed. Being highly rated wherever books are rated. Again, fellow Hoppa, doing the damn thing. Congratulations, Cooper Smith. So, all done. No more. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm still going to read Iron Widow. I have less than a week to do it, and I'm going to be reading it myself as opposed to listening to it, which may mean that it's going to take longer. It may take shorter if I can, like, really devote myself to, like, if I, if I can really concentrate which is sometimes is a problem for me. I've told you in the previous video that I read The Hunger Games in one day. <laughs> I think I can do it. I think I can do Iron Widow, and I'm going to be doing another video talking about same same as here, pre-reading and post-reading. And I'm, I think I'm also going to do some uh, a bit of a bit of light surface level research on Uzetan, but I'll get into that when I get into the next video. For now, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope this review of both books was something interesting for you. Uh, I've 
yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the whole experience uh, of the readathon later. But for now, I'll just say this was great. I loved both of these books. I uh, can't wait to get into the next one. Thank you for watching. See you soon.